I'm going to record. There we go. Okay. And let's see, let me share my screen. All right. So the question was kind of walk, walk us through um, kind of the code and, and what's going on in the code uh, so you can understand a little bit better of what's going on behind the scenes, right? Um, <clears throat> all right. So the first thing maybe, let me go ahead and let the simulation run because you know what we're what we're ultimately going to be doing is we're going to create a model with and this is a very simple dynamic field model uh, and I'll show you how how simple it is when we look at the code. It's just got a couple of elements, uh, and uh, what we're going to do is embed that model into some task or some scenario, right? So the scenario I created in that 2020 20 paper, I keep saying 2020 20, 20, three times as if. Yeah, sorry about that. The 2020 paper uh, is we're going to show, let's say, a kid three colors or three spatial locations. And then we're going to turn the inputs off and ask them to remember those locations, let's say, for a couple of seconds. And then, of course, in an experiment at the end of the delay, we would probe um, and ask, where was the remembered object? So in this case, they would point to the left because that's the one they remember, right? You just saw the field activity completely plummet. What I'm doing there is I am uh, dropping the resting level to get rid of all the peaks and conceptually reset the model for the next trial. Okay, and then I'm presenting, uh, in this case, three new colors. Uh, you only see two bumps in the field because I've got uh, a randomization in there to select random colors or random locations. And it just so happened two of them are really close together. And so the model, what it will do in that case is remember the average spatial position of the, of the stimuli. So in this case, it's gonna, it looks like it's remembering two items. And so at the end of the delay, it might report there was a, an object over there and an object over there. Then I reset it again, next trial, present three random locations or, or colors if you wanna think that way. Now they're all clustered together on the right side, it looks like. Actually, there was probably one over here too. And then I run, you know, the present the colors for a certain period of time, then there's the delay and then we reset again. So, so that's what we're just gonna go through, I think 30 trials of doing that. And uh, over the course of the trials, the interesting thing is to look at how this memory trace, which is the cyan line, evolves. Um, so I'm gonna actually, I'll let that, I'll let the model keep running while I talk. And then when we come back, it'll be in a later trial and we can check in on how the memory trace is doing. Okay, so to then um, run the model, there are uh, three, uh, three key files that we create for any any Cosavino simulator. Um, the first file is the sim file, and that's the actual model. Okay, so sim file always has the same structure. It's got this command at the top that says sim equals simulator. Uh, and then let me just walk you through uh, what what is in the code here. Uh, I should mention before I, I dive into the, the details, uh, if you go to the Cosavina folder, there's a documentation file, a PDF. This is like the Bible for Cosavina or the user's guide for Cosavina, okay? So this has basically a nice handy table of contents at the front, which I use all the time. And uh, with hyperlinks to, uh, in the document, so if I want to, for example, uh, create an element like a neural field, I can click on neural field and it'll jump me to, here's what a neural field is, here's how you set a neural field up in Cosavina, including the parameters and the components associated with the neural field. Okay. Um, now I never build uh, a neural field model from, uh, from scratch. Uh, I should also point out that in Cosavina, 
there is an examples folder that has all sorts of nifty little uh, tools for building dynamic field architectures. Um, these are tools built around exercises in our DFT primer book, which was published in uh, 2016. Um, but the, the point is, if you, if you open up any of these launcher files and you run them, uh, they will pull up uh, a, a different dynamic field architecture. And you can kind of, if you've, you know, one game is, let's say I want to invent a model that you think is kind of related to another DFT model. You can always start from the first model and then adapt the code to your purposes. And that's pretty much how I always create a model. Right, I never start from scratch, always just copying code and then adapting it. Okay, so what do we want in this particular model for this paper? Um, uh, first, I created three stimuli. Those are the different colors or locations that I'm going to present to the to the simulant to the to the field model. Um, so there's a, a Cosavina element called Gauss stimulus one D, so one dimensional. Uh, and we give it a name, stimulus one. It's a one-dimensional structure, so we have to call it the size of the, of the dimension. Uh, field size is in another file, so I'm just going to use that value here. This is the width of excitation or the width of the Gaussian input. This is the position. I'm just putting it at a default position of zero, and I'm going to set that. That's going to be the position of the actual Gaussian input. So I'm going to set that in my, my other code. Uh, and I set the width to be a quarter. Oh, no, this is, sorry, this is the position. This is the width, this is the strength, and this is the position. OK. Um, yeah, so sigma x excitation, that's always a width, right? So again, how big it is, how big the element is, Here's the width of the Gaussian. Here's the strength of the Gaussian. And here's the position of the Gaussian. And then I've got two other flags here, one of which is uh, you can have a normalized Gaussian or not. And you can have it wrap around like a circular field or not. And so I am using normalized, but I'm not wrapping it around because it was spatial positions. So I wanted to just go off to the left and go off to the right. Okay, so I got stimulus one, two, three. You can see codes all the same, but I'm positioning them initially at uh, basically 25, 50, and 75, different positions. Then to make my, my life easy in the, um, in the one of the displays I wanted to like show all the inputs summed together, so I create this uh, new element called sum inputs, and I give it a name, I give it a size, and I say, what are the things I want to sum up? Well, I want to sum up stimulus one, stimulus two, and stimulus three. And that's just going to be useful for plotting purposes to show them all as one object instead of or one element instead of multiple elements. Okay, so that's just to create my inputs for the 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 the, uh, the the task essentially. Then I create my neural field. So I, I make a call to this neural field element. I give it a name, field U. That's just a historical name we usually use, but you could you could call it Barney. You could call it whatever you want. Uh, I give it a size. Uh, the next parameter is going to be. The, what is that? Uh, let's look at what that is. The next parameter is, ah, come on. What does Adobe want me to do? Great. Okay, accept and continue the updated. Uh, <laughs> okay, maybe it's going to go away for a bit. So if I go to neural field and I say tau, okay. So 
in the middle here, you can see, I don't know if that's too small, but blow it up a little bit. Uh, the first parameter is size. So that's field size. Second parameter is tau. So that's how quickly the time, it's sort of, it's called the time scale of, of excitation in the field or activation in the field. And it um, influences essentially how quickly the field goes to its attractor state. So one attractor state in the field would be forming a peak when I have input. So the tau is going to say, how quickly do I go to that attractor state? Uh, if you know anything about dynamical systems, this is related to the relaxation time of the, of the dynamical system. And important thing to remember is um, small numbers are fast. It only takes a few time steps to get to the attractor. Large numbers are slow. It takes a long, many time steps to go to the attractor. Okay. So a tau of 20 is actually pretty fast. Uh, the next parameter is the resting level of the field. Um, so we always use a negative resting level, which is kind of analogous to the negative resting potential of a neuron. And then conceptually zero activation is meaningful. So when you go into positive activation, we usually think about that as the, the field is going above threshold and starting to engage local excitation and surround inhibition, for example. Uh, and then the last parameter is uh, uh, what's called the beta, which is uh, the slope of uh, the, the thresholding function, basically. So as the field grows towards zero activation, at every site in the field, we are essentially thresholding that activation. And once you uh, come close to the threshold of zero, you're going to start sharing activation, self-exciting your, your, yourself and exciting your neighbors. So basically, as you go toward threshold, neural interactions start to kick in. And the beta is how steep the thresholding function is. So uh, a beta of like one is kind of a soft threshold. So as you come towards zero, you start uh, kicking in neural interactions very weakly. And then as you go above zero, you start to ramp up neural interactions gradually until you get to a high activation. Uh, with a beta of four, it's it's more like a step function. So with a beta of four, you have to get really close to zero for interactions to kick in, and then they really ramp up once they, they get going. All right, next element is the memory trace. To, to add a memory trace in, I give it a name, field size. Uh, memory traces have uh, two time scales. So the first is the time scale, the what we call the build time scale. So this is um, how quickly the memory trace grows. Okay. And then the second parameter is the decay time scale, how quickly the memory trace decays. Uh, and then the last uh, parameter is um, great question. The last parameter is uh, the threshold for the memory trace and um, the default is 0.5. That means um, that the field activities need to get above 0.5 for you to start accumulating a memory trace of that location. Uh, and that uh, we use uh, 0.5 instead of zero. Um, to sort of ensure that the field activities have really ramped up and got, gotten going um, so that we've really formed a peak, essentially. We only want to form a memory trace where a peak is formed. Uh, speaking of memory traces, let's see how our, yep, yeah, there we go. So I was curious where our model was at. So you can see uh, how the memory trace is traces distributed over all these different trials. We're not quite yet at that homogeneous boost, but we're getting there. Uh, and you can see these little divots where, um, you know, these are places where there just hadn't been many exposures to those colors yet, just because of the randomization that I that I put on the, the field. 
Oh, actually, that must, must have just finished. No, nope. next round. Okay, we'll come back. Okay, so that's the memory trace. Um, next thing is we're going to create uh, the, what are called the neural interactions in the model. So um, this next uh, line is going to specify how the neurons interact, uh, interact within our field U. So this is basically that local excitation surround inhibition function I talked about. Um, we're going to use what's called lateral interactions, 1D. Um, we give it a name. So this is going to be um, uh, U influencing itself. So self-excitation and surround inhibition basically within the field. Um, here's the field size again. This is the width of um, local excitation. This would be the strength of local excitation. Uh, you could say, why is it zero? It's zero because I'm going to, I needed to reset that in the, the main simulator. So that, that'll be a value specified uh, in a second. Uh, this is the width of surround inhibition, strength of surround inhibition, and then this is uh, global inhibition. And then those same values again, true if you want to normalize your interactions. And this last one is a, oh, actually circular versus, and a, this is going to be normalized. So I had those backwards before, sorry about that. Okay, so I've now specified a field uh, and a memory trace. Here's this local excitation surround inhibition function for the field. And I then need to have the, the memory trace um, project back up into the field. Uh, I should note up here, when I created the memory trace, there are these parameters at the end I forgot to mention. So this says that the input so there's always there's often three parameters at the end of a Kosovina call. Uh, the first one is always going to be the input to the structure you just created. So we just created a memory trace, and we can say, what's the input to that element? Well, the input to that element is going to be the output of our field. So whenever there's above threshold activity, meaning output in the field, that's when we want the memory trace to grow. So this field U and output at the end here specifies the two the two parts of the input that are going into memU. If we had a third element there, that would say where should the output of memU go? Um, and we didn't specify that here. The reason we didn't specify that here is when we project the memory trace strength into the field, we always uh, do what we, 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 we convolve that with a kernel. <laughs> what does that mean? We basically kind of uh, project the memory trace into the field uh, and smear it out a bit. Uh, and we give it a strength. And that strength parameter just allows us to control the dial on how strong the memory influences the field activities and vice versa. Okay, so we, we talked about the local excitation surround inhibition. If I go to the memory trace line, this is now the memory trace influencing you. So how memory trace projects activation back up. It's got a field size. Uh, it's got a width of how it, that how it spreads out in space. It's got a strength here. Uh, and what we can see is that memory U output is the input to this smearing out function. And we're going to project that into field U. Okay, last couple elements here. We're going to add noise into the um, into our, our model. And we often use something called um, spatially correlated noise in dynamic field models. Um, if you look at the, the model in action here, you can see it's kind of got this wavy structure to it. That's, uh, that's spatially correlated noise. 
So if, if I added random noise to this model, it would be random at every position in the field, right? And that actually doesn't have an enormous effect on a field because it's got this metric structure, spatial structure to it. So uh, to, to really properly model the variance we see in human data, we've turned toward what's called spatially or correlated noise or wavy noise. Uh, and what that does is it, uh, if you get like a wave of noise on one side of the peak, it can actually shift the peak in the direction of that noise source, okay? The reason it does that is you get sort of this uh, coherent set of neurons in, uh, activated by the noise, and they can then excite their local neighbors and inhibit neighbors far away and actually shift the peak a little bit. So we did a lot of early work um, modeling, for example, spatial working memory and, how, and drifts in spatial working memory. Uh, and we discovered that this spatially correlated noise is actually a, a good noise source to use for, for, for fields. So to create spatially correlated noise, I create a, a vector of, of noise. So basically a random value at every site in the field. And then I do this convolution uh, trick again. So I'm going to basically smear out that noise with a Gaussian, kind of like we, I just talked about smearing out the memory trace with a Gaussian. Okay, so we create this uh, Gaussian kernel. We input the random noise into the Gaussian kernel and we project the result to field U, and that puts the noise into the field. So again, what that's doing is it's creating the waves in the field here that you're seeing in the simulation. <clears throat> okay, next element, I when I was running the simulation, I realized I needed to get rid of the peaks after every trial, kind of reset the field. So I added a boost stimulus to do that. So um, this is literally just a homogeneous value we add or subtract to the field. Um, so I give it a name and I give it an initial strength of zero. And again, I'll set, I'll set that in the other, in the other code. Uh, and the, um, yes, that is fed into field U and I'm not sure this bit of code is even needed, but it's there. Uh, and then the last thing I want to do is, is trace the field activities through time. And there's an element called running history that allows you to basically uh, keep track of the field over a certain time window. And that is useful for these running history plots where you can see sort of the field activities evolving through time. So that's just like a data capture element. Okay, so, you know, really at the end of the day, this is the core bit, create a field and create a memory trace, and then specify the interactions in the field and how the memory trace feeds back onto the field activities. So really four lines of code to create this model. And then I needed, you know, the stimuli to embed it in my task. I wanted some noise to get some variance in, in the behavior of the model, a boost because of how I implemented the task and a history for a plotter. Okay. So that's step one, create the model. Uh, step two is display the model on a canvas. And that's what the graphical user interface file does. Okay. And I'm not gonna go through the details of this code um, uh, oh, forgot to change this one. Uh, I'm gonna do this now and then I'll push, I'll push an update to, um, to, to uh, GitHub after this, this presentation, but I had, I had the two elements backwards. So this, this bit of code, um, if I put the simulator up, this bit of code creates the top plot. This bit of code creates the middle plot. This bit of code creates the bottom plot. And 
this bit of code creates the buttons at the bottom. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, complicated, you know, MATLAB code here. I have never written this from scratch ever because I wouldn't even know how to begin that. So I always just grab uh, GUI code from another simulator and start from there. Um, yeah, and away you go. Okay, third file then, and the last bit is the BAM file. And basically, conceptually, you know, we've now got a model. We've now got a way to visualize the model. And now we need to put the model in a task. And that's what the BAM file does. Okay. So if you're like a, you know, a, a, what used to be called the programmer and what is now called the coder, you would call this like the main line of your, your old C code. That's when, when I, you know, I'm dating myself. Actually, I, I, can, I can go further and say this would be the main line of my Pascal code when I was first in computer science. Okay, <clears throat> so let me walk you through uh, what's going on in, in this bit of the code. Um, I usually clear and close everything when I start MATLAB. So I put those in there. These are the some of the parameters I need in the SIM file. So I just say field size is 100, sig width of excitation is five, width of inhibition, which has to be broader than excitation. I pick 12.5. So these are, are literally just parameters I used over here to make kind of constructing the SIM file a little bit easier. Then I start to design my task. So I want my stimulant on every little trial. I want my the, the field to, I'm going to let it run for 100 time steps. Then I'm going to turn the stimuli on. And then I'm going to turn them off 200 time steps later at 300 time steps. And then I'm going to let it run for 500 time steps. And that's the memory delay. And that's going to be the trial structure. I'm going to start with some basic positions for my stimuli at 20, 50, and 80. So left, center, and right in the field. Uh, I'm going to uh, Present targets at random separations from stimulus position above. I'm going to use that this 40 in my um, my randomization, and I'm going to present the colors or the locations with a strength of five. Okay, why five? Uh, in part because if you remember, my resting level is minus five, so I need. I need excitation to get at least up to five before interactions will kick in and start to build a peak. Uh, so in this simulator, I said, let's start with a stimulus strength of, of five to get us up to act, the activation level or the, the zero threshold level. Okay, then I say, uh, I, I have this mode, mode thing. So um, when we create a simulator, we create uh, I usually create three, well, actually, I usually create, I used to create three modes. I usually now only create two modes. And this is where the BAM comes from. So zero was for batch mode where I'm running lots of simulations with one processor. One is for auto mode with visualization, which is what you're seeing here. I think my model's done because my fan went off. So it looks like we got a nice homogeneous memory trace at the end. Um, so that's auto mode with visualization. And then two is um, the way we usually run simulate simulations on like a machine that has multiple cores and you can then parallelize, parallelize the running of your simulations if you're doing lots of quantitative simulation work. So with big models, I usually run those on a high performance computing cluster and I run the model across 96 cores simultaneously, and it really speeds up simulation. And I could talk about that kind of in future tutorials. Then I say, how many repetitions do I want if I'm running batch mode or running lots of simulations? So I'm just running one because I want to visualize. This is conceptually, n reps is like the number of subjects. So let's say I'm going to run you know, 
uh, 30 trials, and I want to iterate that over 30 subjects to replicate my experiment. So n reps would be 30, and n trials would be 30. Okay. So conceptually, whenever I use CDFT code, I often use n reps as the number of subjects. Okay, then I added this trial check thing because I wanted to, for the paper, I wanted to present the targets at 20, 50, and 80 every X number of trials so that I could make a plot for the paper. Um, I sampled the field every five time steps for the plots that you, the, the running history thing, and then I stored it. So that set the, the running history duration. And there's some math there to figure out. Okay, next I uh, call the sim file and initialize the simulator. And then if I want to visualize the model while it's running, which we have to do in this auto mode, I call the GUI file and initialize the graphical user interface. Uh, next thing is I loaded some parameters. So if you look on the simulator, there's um, the a save and load button. So if I, uh, one of the things you can do, let me actually quit this image because it's already done running. And let me hit run again. Um, one of the things you can do with these graphical user interfaces is I can pause the simulation, which is nice. I can also click uh, the parameters button, and that will give me access to every parameter in the, ar the architecture. So up here is my stimulus. So I've got my width and strength of my stimulus and the position. If I look at the drop down, I can go down to like field U, and I've got my tau parameter, my eight resting level parameter, and my beta parameter. If I go to my lateral interactions, U to U, I can change local excitation and surround inhibition, et cetera. So you can actually change these things on the fly while the simulator is running. And if you hit apply, it will then act, apply those parameter changes and continue running the simulator. So this is kind of a nice way to right, tune your model up to, to have it show the behaviors or the functions you want it to show. And then let's say you find some parameters you're happy with, you can then hit the save button. Um, and then you can save what's called a JSON file, which basically stores the entire architecture and all the parameters of your model in one compact file, text file. And uh, you can then load that JSON file in to go back to that parameter setting or the other parameter setting you saved last week or when you saved a month ago. Okay, so the that's a, a really nice feature, I think. Um, and this is just an inline command that says, uh, here's the final parameters for this paper, load those in so that we can set all the parameters of the architecture uh, without having to do that manually. And similarly, without having to specify all those values in this in this sim file, right? So when you're actually working with a model, you're not changing this the 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 parameters here. You're actually changing the parameters in that interactive GUI and saving them, and then reloading them in. And that's much a much more humane way to change parameters. Okay. So that's sim load. Then uh, when I I did this paper, I determined that the Self, you know, in the first figure, I changed the self excitation. These are the the parameters I was changing. So, twenty four x self excitation strength for the infant, twenty five for the child, twenty six for the old for the adult. Uh, and so, this is just a way to to manually specify: Do I want to run a simulation of an infant, a child, or an adult? And then you can also turn the memory strength on and off by changing its amplitude. So I think in the first figure in that paper, I didn't have the memory trace running. So I set the amplitude of the memory trace to U input to zero to turn that, toggle that on and off. Uh, and then other parameters I modified relative to the default 
parameter file above. This was, um, yeah, I, I did this as I was kind of, I had the model close to what I wanted to show in the paper with these parameters. And then I did some final tweaking when I was making the final figures to sort of tune it up. And for some reason, I didn't just save that into the JSON file, which I could have done. Instead, I wanted to, I don't know. I don't know why I did that, but I did. So there you go. Um, I could say, yeah, the other thing you're seeing here is, of course, here's how you change parameters in, in, in the BAM file, which is a nice thing to know. Okay, so then we're going to go into three loops. This for loop specifies, remember, how many subjects I want. And so in this model, I only ever want one because I'm all, only just visualizing the model. Uh, and you can see there's some code here, uh, the SIM2 business. Uh, that's actually in there to enable um, uh, parallel processing with dynamic field models. So that's kind of just, if you put that into your BAM file, you'll be set up to do parallel processing later. Um, the next for loop is the trial loop. And what you can see, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, for each trial, I'm setting the positions of the stimuli. So I take my base positions, which are stim position one, two, and three, and I'm adding a random number to shift the value uh, around, uh, like I think, 40. So it can go plus or minus 40 in terms of its position. So that's how I'm kind of randomly uh, positioning where the inputs are. Then I've got this code that says um, every 10 trials uh, just presented at the base locations of 20, 50, and 80. So I could make my figures. And that's all that's in the trial loop. And then we come to the time loop. So this is where the actual simulation of the dynamic field model is happening. So I'm simulating from uh, time uh, one to time T max. And what I'm doing is uh, for the first 50, 50 time steps, if I'm beyond trial one, I'm gonna reset the field. And I do that by applying this boost with an amplitude of minus 50. So that's when you see the floor go out on the field activity, it's applying that boost to the model. Literally adding a value of minus, few, minus 50 everywhere in the field. And then after 50 time steps, that comes back up to its resting level. Uh, next, I, I turn the stimuli on and off. So if, if time is greater than 100 and less than 300, then I'm going to turn my stimuli on. First, I specify the amplitude of the stimuli. So I'm turning stimulus one, two, and three. I'm giving it a stimulus strength of five, five, and five. And then I'm specifying the positions of stimulus one, two, and three. And that's stim position new one, two, and three. So that turns the inputs on. And then I turn the inputs off simply by setting the amplitude of stimulus one, two, and three to zero. Uh, next is some Costavina code to just monitor the GUI or the graphical user interface. So you just always plop that into your BAM file and then end the time loop and the trial loop and end the repetition loop. And that is basically the entire shebang top to bottom. Okay, let me stop the recording.